بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي يجيبني حين أناديه ويستر علي كل عورة وأنا أقصيه ويعظم النعمة علي فلا أجازيه نحمده ونسبحه ونقدسه على آلائه ونعمائه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إلها واحدا أحدا فردا صمدا قيوما نؤمن له بالربوبية ونقر له بالعبودية من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كأفضل ما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين والأوصياء والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وعترة نبيك الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين والأخيار من صحابته المنتجبين ومن يتبعهم بإحسان وإيمان إلى يوم الدين عباد الله أوصيكم وأوصي نفسي بتقوى الله ولزوم أمره قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى صدق الله العلي العظيم One of the important <clears throat> concepts and issues and doctrines that we must discuss regarding the character of the Prophet وسلم, and things that are related to him and his conduct and his behavior and his reason and his intelligence and we must understand is the concept of sahwu nabi sahwu means when someone is in doubt someone is in a state of forgetfulness or unintentional when he commits an unintentional mistake not and not deliberate mistake but unintentional and the distraction Sahu also includes the distraction when you lose your concentration for a few seconds or minutes or some people a few days. You know. And the absent-mindedness, this is called Sahu. So did the prophets, did the Prophet وسلم, experience Sahu in his life or not? Was he at some point absent-minded? Did he lose his focus? Did he forget sometimes? When he does prayers, many of us, you remember, when we do our prayers, whether we are in jama'ah or individual, sometimes we go through the state of sahu, doubt. Is this the second rak'ah? Is this the third? Is this the eighth rak'ah? You know? So, did he experience this or not? There is a debate. There is a debate among the Muslim theologians, Mufassireen, the exegist, Muhaddithin, the transmitters of Hadith. There is a debate among them. And when we examine the Hadith in both sides, or on both sides, in Sahih al-Bukhari and other books of Hadith in the Sunni tradition, in the Shia books like Bihar al-Anwar and others, we will find that the number of the hadith that 
speak about Sahw al-Nabi, they total 12 hadiths, all of them. They've been narrated that the, the Prophet did commit Sahu or doubt, he experienced doubt or forgetfulness, he forgot sometimes. But let's begin with the Sunni tradition. In the Sunni tradition, they believe, yes, the Prophet can, practically can experience sahu and doubt, even when he leads the prayers. Sometimes he forgets, this is the second rak'ah, this is the third, so the Muslims can correct him. They believe that the Prophet, sometimes he forgets the Qur'an. He's uh, reciting the Qur'an in the Salat, and all of a sudden he forgets to, con to continue. So someone from behind him reminds the Prophet. So they believe in that. They believe that this happened and took place. Furthermore, some Sunni scholars believe that the Prophet was not ma'soom. And this is the minority of them, not the majority. The majority, they believe in Asmatun Nabi, his inf infallibility, that he does not commit a sin. Others, however, although very few, they believe that he's a human being, so he can commit a sin too. He can violate. He's a human being. He's not an angel falling from the sky. When we come to the Shia tradition and the tradition of Ahlul Bayt, the Imamiyya, Shia school of thought, we unanimously agree that the Prophet وسلم, not only our Prophet, all the Prophets, all the messengers with the Imams were ma'sumin, infallibles. They did not commit sin. And of course we have an interpretation for these verses in the Quran that suggest the Prophet or other messengers committed a sin. There is tafsir, specific tawjih or interpretation for them. وَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ فَغَوَى Asa in the normal language is violation, but when it comes to Adam in that particular context, in that particular incident, it's not asyan. It's not violation. He did not break the law. We have, uh, we have some explanation, and I mentioned this numerous times on this podium, and maybe in the future we can also <coughs> reiterate what we said. But let's focus on the Sahu al-Nabi, Sahu, absent-mindedness. Does he forget? Does he commit an unintentional mistake in his prayers or in his private life, in the marketplace, at home, outside? The Shias are divided here into two groups. 95% of them, they believe that the Prophet is ma'soom, even when it comes to sahu, not only he's ma'soom against the intentional mistake, but even he's ma'soom, infallible, and protected, and immune against the unintentional mistake. So no state of sahu, absent-mindedness, or doubts goes through his mind. That is the idea and the belief of 95% of Shia theologians, led by a Shaykh al-Mufid, who lived a thousand years ago. And he wrote a special thesis, Risala, on this subject, to refute those who believe that the Prophet, he went through doubts in his Salat and outside the Salat. He proved that these are not reliable ahadith. We cannot depend on them. So they are not reliable. Followed by a Sayyid, al Shaykh al Mufid, we have others such as a Shaykh al Tusi. By the way, Shaykh al Tusi, his nickname is Shaykh al Ta'ifa. Ta'ifa means the, the tribe or the group, which means reference to the Shia Imamin. Shaykh al Ta'if. Shaykh al Tusi, who moved from Baghdad to Najaf, and he was the one over a thousand years ago who established the seminary in Najaf because the seminary of the Shia in Baghdad, the Hawza, was attacked by the Abbasites, was completely destroyed. The schools, the ulama were arrested and killed. The books were thrown, tossed in the Tigris River to the extent that the color of the water changed into blue because of the ink. 
At that time, the books were not printed. They were written, handwritten, manuscripts. So they tossed thousands and thousands of books into the Tigris River, Dijla, in Baghdad. For many months, the color of the water was blue. So we lost a huge amount of our legacy during the attack and the assault of the Abbasites against the school of Ahlul Bayt and their institutions and their scholars and their ulama. And Sheikh Al-Tusi could not live in Baghdad anymore. He could not live. Even today, some areas in Baghdad, in Nainawa, if you are a Shia, then you are liable for death with no question. In Syria, in other areas, you are a criminal just because you are Shia. Even if you have done nothing, sitting in your room and do nothing, you are a criminal. So you deserve death. The story is repeating itself now. So he moved the house of the seminary from Baghdad to Najaf more than a thousand years ago. His name is Shaykh Al-Ta'ifa Al-Tusi. He also subscribed to this view. Al-Muhaqqiq Al-Hilli, Al-Allam Al-Hilli, and so on and so. Uh, they believe that the Prophet not only would not commit a sin, but also he would not forget. Because he is protected. سَنُقْرِئُكَ فَلَا تَنْسَى إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ When we teach you the Qur'an, you would not forget. Sometimes we memorize the Qur'an today, we memorize Surah Qul Huwa Allah Ahad today, we forget it tomorrow. But the Prophet, him, when the Qur'an was installed in him, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah said to him, you would never forget. Sanuqri'uk, we will teach you the pronunciation, the reading of this book. You will memorize it forever. Fala tansa, you would never forget. Not only the Quran, you would not forget your duties. If you are the Imam, you would not be in doubt whether this is the second rak'ah or third rak'ah. We would not allow Satan to get close to you. However, there is 5% of the Shia scholars who believe, no, the Prophet was a human being. What's wrong with him to, to have doubt? But they differentiate those 5%. They, which is led by a Shaykh al-Saduq, another credible Shia scholar and transmitter of hadith, muhaddith in the Shia tradition, in the Imamiya tradition. He says that we differentiate between the public life of the Prophet and the private life. In the public life, as a Prophet, as a messenger, as a leader, he would not forget. In the prayers, when he leads the prayers for the congregation, he would not forget. He would not experience a state of doubt or sahu or nisyan because he has to deliver the message complete and if he starts making mistakes in his prayers, or sometimes he gives the wrong answer to someone, and then he forgets, oh, oh, that was wrong. I have to correct myself. Then in that case, he's going to lose the trust of the public. Public would say that, well, he, he made a mistake yesterday. Who says that today he would not make another mistake? Tomorrow he would not make a third mistake. So they start doubting about him about his verdicts, about his comments, about his commands. So Allah had protected him in this area, the area of Sharah, where he is a leader, a prophet, deals with his congregation. He would not experience sahu, but in his private life, what's wrong with that? He's a human being. Now the types of, and they also distinguish between our sahu and the Prophet sahu. They say when a normal human being experience forgetfulness or absent-mindedness, then this is the work of the Satan. إِنَّهُ مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ وَمَا أَنْسَانِيهِ إِلَّا الشَّيْطَانِ أَنْ أَذْكُرَهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says one of the tactics, the ways of Satan to take over us, to overwhelm us, is to make us forget.
to dominate our life, dominate our thoughts, our mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nahl, chapter 16, verse 100. Allah says to the Prophet, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ When you begin your prayers, the Quranic recitation and your prayers, in the beginning seek refuge in God from the Satan, the wicked Satan. فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لَهُ سُلْطَانٌ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُ However, he does not have control. Sultan here means control, authority. Dominance. He cannot have dominance on those who are well established, those who have firm belief. He cannot get it close to them. They have immunity. They have protected themselves with God. So he cannot reach them. He's too weak to reach them. Nevertheless, إِنَّمَا سُلْطَانُهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَتَوَلَّوْنَهُ His sultan, his control, his authority, his tactics, his manipulation is only over those who follow him and listen to him. Those who do not have strong faith in God. When they don't have strong faith in God, the substitute, the alternative, is that shaitan is, take, is going to take over. He's going to take over their thoughts, their minds, their life. So he can only manipulate and pause a danger on those الَّذِينَ يَتَوَلَّوْنَهُ those who follow him and listen to him. The weak spirited ones. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِهِ مُشْرِكُونَ So the state of forgetfulness comes with us, ordinary people from Satan. The influence of Satan on us and our life. But the state of sahu of the Prophet, does it come from Satan too? Does not come from Satan. Satan cannot go close to them. It comes from Allah. Allah wants the Prophet to forget this specific, specific idea. This is the argument of those, the 5% who believe that the Prophet can experience sahu, an intentional mistake in his life. Follow me closely. You have to follow me here. Then what is the wisdom if you ask them why Allah allowed the Prophet to forget? They say, huh, good question. Allah will allow the Prophet at certain occasions, not regularly, once in a while, to forget, to curtail, to curtail the ghulu, to curtail us that to believe that Prophet is equal to God. Because when it comes to God, Allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum, la ta'khuduhu sinatun wala no. God is always awake, self-subsisting. Neither slumber overtake him nor sleep. He's always awake, always tentative, always responsive. He can always see. He would not take a break. He would not get fatigued. He would not get weak. He cannot hear today. He cannot see very well. Always he sees very well. He hears very well. So you cannot compare the Prophet to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to leave some room, some difference between Allah and the Prophet. If you claim that the Prophet would never, never, ever forget, then you are comparing him to God. In this case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the people to realize that there is a difference between God the Creator and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who is the created. There is a difference. To curtail those who believe in ghulu because within the Shia community and the Sunnis, we have a small group who believe in the concept of ghulu. Ghulu is excessiveness or exaggeration. Excessiveness and exaggeration. Do you know that some Shias, who used to be Shias, smaller group, they believe Imam Ali he created the universe. Allah was sitting on the couch and said, listen, take this task and you create the universe. They believe in that. This is ghulu. This is kufr. This is polytheism, shirk. This is shirk. So Allah says we want the Prophet to sometimes forget so people don't get confused. Don't compare him to God. There is a difference between him as the slave of God, the servant of God, the creator, the created of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore it is okay that he can forget in his 
private sphere, not the public one. Not when he's giving injunctions or instructions or guidance or teaching. We would keep him immune in that area because people would lose faith in him if he keeps making mistakes. But in his private life, it's okay for him to experience the state of sahu. And inshallah, once in a while, we will touch upon these philosophical and theological subjects in the Holy Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wal-Asr inna al-insana lafi khusrin illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu al-salihat wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ahli baytih al-tayyibin al-tahirin. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونسبحه ونقدس على آلائه ونعمائه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كأفضل ما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على خلفاء نبيك وأوصيائه وأهل بيته علي أمير المؤمنين وقائد الغر المحجلين وعلى البضعة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وعلى سبط نبي الرحمة وسيد شباب أهل الجنة الحسن والحسين عليهم السلام وعلى علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي عجل الله تعالى فرجه وسهل مخرجه وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه عباد الله أوصيكم وأوصي نفسي بتقوى الله ولزوم أمره There is an important questions that <coughs> question that we are always asked and the question is does God legislate in the Islamic Sharia ah, in the Islamic law when he legislates when he creates a law produces introduces a law for us should that be compatible with our own personal understanding and taste and a flavor? Meaning that should every Islamic law, when I re read it, look at it, should I accept it naturally, automatically? When I say it, I say, wow, yes, this makes sense to me. So I would accept it. Is this the case? The answer, no, this is not the case. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not create the law because according to my own taste and a flavor. Because my taste, my flavor, my rational, my reason, my brain, my aql is limited. And Allah's reason is unlimited. Unlimited. So sometimes the limited cannot understand the unlimited. And therefore many, you hear this story, you know, Oftentimes in Muslim congregations, Muslim societies, among the youth, among others here in the West, we hear some Muslim individuals who says, this does not make sense to me. Hijab doesn't make sense. Homs does not make sense. You know, abstaining from alcohol does not make sense. You know, it doesn't make sense to you. This is your problem, you know. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it makes sense. When I created this law, I know it makes sense. Don't look at yourself. I'm looking at the entire universe. I'm not look, looking at Hajj Fulan and Sheikh Fulan here and there. Allah considers the maslaha in the Islamic legislation and Sharia. We have masalih and mafasid. We have interests that not only pertains to you and your family and your congregation in Orange County. It pertains to, enti to the entire universe. And when there is mafsada which is against maslaha, the opposite of maslaha, mafsad, evil, evil thing, evil result. Also it pertains, when Allah says this is haram, 
It could be for you as an individual, it's okay. It would not hurt you, but it would hurt millions and millions of others. It's like the law here. People, some people would like to speed on the freeway. They say 65 miles per hour would not work for me. I wish the government would make it 95. If you ask me, I wish it make it 125. <laughs> I love to speed. But the law says, listen, you love this, but the rest is not good for them. Maybe it is safe for you because you know how to drive. You don't drink, you know, under the influence. But for others, we have to consider safety and security for the rest of the community too. One of the main differences between legislation, tashri, and the Sunni tradition and the Shia tradition. And I know I want you to know these points very well, to recognize them. In the Sunni tradition, one of the sources of legislation, tashri, to create law, is the personal reasoning, juristic reasoning. Something like istihsan. The jurist says, this idea, I think this idea is good, so I'll make it a law. Yes, this is one source of legislation, istihsan. Or qiyas, qiyas is comparison. He comes to one mas'ala, one matter, he cannot find something in the Quran or the Hadith, not because it is not found, no, no. But his search is in, inadequate, his search is incomplete, so he, he finds another answer for another mas'ala somewhere else, he brings it to this one. This is comparison, qiyas, a knowledge, which is unacceptable in Islam. We believe that every issue, every single issue we face, you can find an answer for it either here, Al-Quran, or the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And therefore, one day there was a debate between Al Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam and one of his disciples and students by the name of An Nu'man ibn Thabit, Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa today is the leader of the Hanafi tradition, which is the largest Islamic Sunni tradition. They make 27% of the Sunnis worldwide, the Hanafis, who follow Abu Hanifa and Nu'man ibn Thabit. Nu'man was the student of Imam al-Sadiq in Medina. He used to see him every single day, and he was his student for two years. But then Nu'man ibn Thabit Abu Hanifa, he invented few methods to legislate. And Imam al-Sadiq, he realized that. He was aware of them, so he forewarned him by saying to him. He said to him, Ya Nu'man, one day he asked him, because he's his student, what would you do? What would you do when you do not find a verse in the Quran or the hadith of the Prophet? What would you do here? How do you derive the law? Or how do you give the answer to certain issues, certain masail? And Nu'man Abu Hanifa says, I will use analogy comparison. I will find the answer in another mas'ala, I compare it to this and I derive the answer from there. Imam al-Sadiq said to him, don't do that. Because the first one who used comparison and analogy was Iblis. Iblis, when he stood before God, he said, God, I cannot bow down to Adam. God said, why? What's the problem? He said, خلقتني من نار وخلقته من طين. The material you created me from was fire. The material Adam was created from was dirt and always fire is better than dirt so i am better than him he made analogy qiyas comparison he failed so don't do that and then imam started giving him examples from sharia that qiyas is not good don't use qiyas he said to him which is less impure less impure the semen or the urine let me ask you this question. Less impure. Bo both of them are impure. But which one is less impure? Semen, many, or urine, both? Huh? Less impure. Semen, of course. Urine is more impure. 
more impure, more nudges than semen. Then in the case of semen, what you should have to do when semen gets out discharged, you have to take a shower. In the case of urine, what should you do? Do you need shower? You don't need shower. You need wudu. So although bowl urine is worse than semen many, but in the case of bowl, you only need to do wudu. But in the case of semen, which is, which is better than bowl, you have to take a shower. So can you compare here? You cannot compare. For women, Imam al-Sadiq gave him the same answer. Which is important, salat or siyam? What do you think? Salat. No, salat amudu al-deen. The main pillar of, prayer, of, of religion and faith is the prayers. Is definitely more important than siyam, salat. More important than salat. In the case of women when they go through menstrual cycle and they miss, they miss both when they go through menstrual cycle, hayth, they should neither pray nor fast. But after that, when they get clean, should they make up their prayers? No. They don't make up their prayers. How about fasting? Should they make up what they missed of their fasting? Yes. yes. Although fasting is less important than prayers. But Allah says the prayers you are forgiven. Take a break. Don't pray. But the fasting you have to do. This is the second. The third Imam والسلام, said to him, which is worse, murder or fornication, qatl or zina? Murder. Abu Hanifa said, murder, Ibn Rasulullah. Of course, much worse than zina. Imam al Sadiq said to him, but in the case of murder, Allah wanted two witnesses. In the case of fornication, zina, Allah asks for four witnesses. Although qatl is much worse, but Allah said, when, when you need witnesses, bring only two. Only two to witness. But in the case of zina, which is less evil, less evil than qatl, murder, Allah says, in this case, I need four witnesses. So don't compare. Don't do analogy. You cannot fathom and understand God's, God's brain, God's intelligence, God's reason, God's philosophy, God's religion with your own intelligence, with man-made intelligence. You cannot compare it with that. So follow. Deen is ta'abbud, servitude and submission. When God tells you do this, don't tell him this is wrong. I can find another answer. This is the difference, one of the main differences. So in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we don't accept qiyas, analogy. Yes, we use reason, but we try to find the answer from the Kitab, the Holy Quran, and the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. Allahumma aghfir li mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi'an lahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujibu al da'awat One more announcement before I conclude uh, the Shura Islamic Shura Council of Southern California which is an umbrella organization for most of the masajid and Islamic centers here are having a conference on March first Saturday and we have tickets if you want to go to the conference brother Salam Al Hariri is here so you can get the tickets from him inshallah and I suggest that if you can make it it is better to make it because we have to strengthen the unity the harmony the respect the understanding between the Shias and the Sunnis in this part of the world inshallah ta'ala وعجل في فرج سيدنا ومولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات تواب الفاتحة مع الصلوات. آه.